My name is Maren, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Chicago and uh, a fellow of uh, the Marine Biological Laboratory. Um, uh, we are here today uh, to talk about AMIA. Uh, the, the, the program for this meeting is quite straightforward. First, um, uh, I'd like to introduce AMIO uh, and talk about its history a little bit, uh, the motivation behind it, uh, and where are we today, uh, plus some of the technical aspects of AMIO. The reason I um, decided to start with a relatively lengthy introduction to AMIO is because we, uh, uh, in your responses, we realized that uh, actually a lot of the people uh, who uh, were uh, those who heard about AMIO but never used it. So uh, I thought this would be a good opportunity to uh, introduce the platform relatively properly. Uh, then we will hear about uh, some of the developers of AMIO who uh, will tell us uh, briefly about some of their contributions to v V7. Finally, we will have a Q&A &A session during which uh, it was uh, your turn to talk and hopefully we'll get to answer some of your questions. And I'm hoping that uh, we will have short questions, short answers and cover as much ground as we can uh, and uh, throughout the talk, I, I'm hoping to give you some pointers about how to get uh, help from the community and reach out to us uh, if you need more. Okay, so uh, let's start with the introduction to AMIO. And um, I will put this statement first uh, and then uh, go into it. Uh, AMIO is an open source community-driven software platform uh, for uh, integrated omics. Uh, but uh, uh, it is what it is today, but there, uh, there was a time uh, during which AMIO was just an idea. Things started around 2014 um, uh, when I was at the Marine Biological Laboratory as a postdoctoral uh, uh, researcher uh, working with uh, Tom Dalmont, who actually introduced me to metagenomics, Joe Vinus, and uh, Özgen Esan. Uh, we at that time formed a team and started thinking about ways to address some of the fundamental problems uh, to push the boundaries of uh, omics research. And, um, and thinking back, uh, and some of these things will apply uh, uh, to, to our current state of affairs in omics. Uh, in uh, 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 2014, omics data uh, uh, were exciting and coming strong at the time. Now, however, there were significant shortcomings when it comes to especially to democratize uh, access to this new resource. So for instance, uh, there were no interactive environments for live scientists to perform in-depth analysis of omics data, especially uh, uh, without what I call complaining, uh, Basically, uh, life scientists uh, uh, need to learn how they should analyze their data from computer scientists, because computer scientists like myself get to implement uh, ideas into code and life scientists who need them uh, are uh, somehow almost obligated to use these tools the way they are designed for them to be used, despite their research questions and intricacies of their interests. So uh, in-depth analyses have been, and still to a certain degree, are uh, uh, exclusive to those who can speak computer. And um, that, that kind of is not really the best way to go about life sciences, in my opinion. And there are no easy ways to combine data sets of different nature. For instance, putting metagenomics together with metatranscriptomics or pangenomics into a single intuitive display uh, was not uh, easy. There were many software tools, there still are, uh, to do many individual things. Uh, yet uh, they were not working in an integrated fashion. But without effective data integration, especially uh, today, um, it's extremely difficult to perform comprehensive analysis of omics data uh, or, or, or employ statistics or uh, uh, support modeling efforts and so on. Um, although integration was a need for everyone recognized, um, and we do still recognize, the true inter integration was lacking. Um, and uh, another thing that that was difficult to achieve was to, uh, to share and communicate findings that emerge from complex data. We often uh, end up uh, uh, creating very deep insights into our very complex data sets. We end up sharing a, a, a perspective from it. And then that one perspective does not reflect the complexity of the rest. When you see a pie chart, bar chart, or a PCA plot, that does not reflect the complexities uh, the, the researchers uh, have observed when they were studying the data, somehow making that available to other researchers, uh, uh, we thought was an important need. And finally, most of you are not interested in this, uh, but uh, I also think this is very important. Uh, access to reasonable data structures for uh, mathematical or uh, algorithmic mining of complex uh, omics data without having to deal with boring steps of coming workflows was not available. So if you're a, a bioinformatician, and all you want to do is to, for instance, um, learn about 
the functional potential of a metagenome or read recruitment results in single nucleotide variants in the context of a single gene, or if you want to understand the ecology of a plasmid, you have to uh, pretty much implement every single step to get to your answers by yourself. Uh, or you are going to use a, a rigid workflow that gives you access to such information, but then it is going to be difficult to uh, go beyond the boundaries of the tool uh, that you have. But if you have a new idea, if you want to implement a statistical inference uh, algorithm or, or a new visualization strategy, you shouldn't have to uh, think about how to deal with uh, BAM files, for instance. That profiling of BAM files should have been done beforehand. So you can get to uh, start working on your own idea. I know these concepts are a little abstract and do not speak uh, to most of you at the moment, but programmers, I hope understand the, the, the importance of having such uh, access. So um, we decided to do something about these uh, as much as we could. Uh, and our aims, of course, evolved over time. We didn't recognize these needs as a whole at the beginning, but things start coming together. But for the uh, first few years, it was only me and Ozjan who had been uh, uh, coding uh, uh, exclusively for AMIO. But in 2017, things started to change. Um, um, uh, uh, Alon Shaber uh, joined our group and he started uh, writing code as well. And as of today, Amio is lucky uh, enough to benefit from the efforts of um, many talented individuals. What you see here on the screen here is an, an incomplete list of names who contribute to the Amio code base on GitHub. This level of engagement is one of the uh, ingredients of Amio as a community platform. The voluntary involvement of many who take uh, the time to implement their ideas into an open source platform so they are more accessible to you and other researchers are driving this uh, uh, platform currently. Uh, it was impossible to list everyone, but uh, uh, there are many, many people who, who uh, uh, throw a stone towards this problem. And uh, of course, I'm very thankful to all these uh, efforts. But uh, literal contributions uh, through code is only one as aspect of any software platform, which is also true for Amio. Uh, uh, in fact, we just published this uh, commentary. It is authored not only by those who contributed code, but also those who help uh, the Amio community with their educational efforts or documentation of the platform or their testing, uh, packaging, and intellectual contributions to steer the direction of our efforts. So. Um, I want to bring up early on, because if you're interested to have a sense uh, of the philosophy behind the platform, I would strongly uh, suggest you to uh, read this article. Um, it's very short, very uh, easy, easy to read, uh, but it, it uh, gives uh, a very brief understanding of what is AMU about and how it differs from uh, other tools, what makes it unique. But now I will change gears and start talking um, about where AMU is today. Um, as of today, uh, uh, in 2021, AMIO is uh, a relatively mature software platform. Uh, we're not there yet. We have a lot of things to think about, but um, mm, mm, there are uh, already multiple stable releases. Uh, V7 came out just a few days ago, as you know. Uh, uh, and AMIO, uh, as of today, uh, has about 120,000 lines of code. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a, a, a trove of code that is relatively carefully written. Uh, these are not just scripts uh, put together, but uh, there is actually a design. Uh, th there's a core library that uh, other libraries uh, rely upon and other tools use those libraries and so on. So this is an evolving system that is um, uh, 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 standing on a large amount of non-redundant code. There are uh, more than 150,000 words in our tutorials currently online. Um, a lot to read, and not all of them are equally relevant uh, to everyone, but we're trying to make sure that uh, uh, life scientists can learn about this platform and start using it without needing us uh, for their science. Uh, AMU has a robust and flexible design that, uh, that keeps extending and new features are being added. Uh, as uh, you perhaps realize if you read the release notes, in V7 we have uh, a new set of tools for tRNA sequencing to bring in uh, 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 transfer RNA biology into omics. And you will hear just a little bit about towards the end of the uh, uh, de developer section. And AMIO uh, benefits from integrated visualization. Uh, we understand the importance of being able to see things uh, and nothing beats that. And AMIO actually uh, uh, does its best to make sure that uh, everything you're doing is also accessible to you through uh, uh, interactive visualization and, um, and, and you get to play with your data. Uh, get your hands dirty, uh, and so on. So uh, what makes, these are the 
things that uh, you can find in a lot of software platforms, L a large code base, a lot of tutorials and uh, flexibility and robustness to a degree. But what, what is it that makes Amio different lies at uh, its architectural design. Uh, Amio has a Lego-like architectural design. Uh, in, uh, uh, in my opinion, it represents a departure from uh, uh, the current uh, popular software development practices and stands on a unique um, uh, uh, architecture uh, uh, that empowers its users with uh, flexibility due to that. For instance, um, this is a busy uh, uh, text and you don't need to read any of these things actually, but I wanted to show uh, all the little programs uh, that Amio comes with. Each of these little programs perform sim simple tasks rather than trying to accomplish entire workflows. Uh, and um, uh, yet they can be brought together and uh, create new workflows. Uh, in this sense, Amio is a lot like Lego. Um, and people who know their questions can piece together different components of Amio to implement uh, uh, unique ideas to address unique needs. Different programs interface with each other uh, through um, uh, Amio artifacts that are generated, modified, queried, split, and merged by individual Amio programs. And um, it is difficult to explain the interconnected nature of these individual tools that come together uh, 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 through concepts, but uh, and Amio can uh, do uh, introspection, knowing how these tools relate to one another and uh, export this uh, interactive network. Uh, uh, so I am just showing a screenshot uh, of it, but this, this kind of shows how these uh, little tools are connected to each other around uh, Amio concepts that most of you are not familiar with. And uh, today we're not going to talk about those, but today I will share with you a resource that you can learn by yourselves if you were to be interested because we understand the vocabulary is very important to start understanding anything at all. And there are certain annual concepts and many different tools can work with them. Uh, and uh, so um, you can actually, uh, for instance, let's say if you have a BAM file, you enter this network from here and you can use, for instance, uh, um, a, a program annual program to profile that BAM file, that BAM file would go into it and then you would end up getting a profile database. Once you have a profile database, you have other options. And you can, for instance, if you have multiple of them, you can use uh, another Amio program to merge them together to get a, a merge profile database. And then uh, once you have a merge profile database, you would have all these options to do little things with. Um, it, it would be up to what you're interested in indeed, but then you would have a lot of options to go. So when you of course look at the entirety of this, the interconnected nature of uh, Amio programs that are glued together by these common data structures um, actually yields a network rather than a predetermined and linear paths for data analysis. So uh, it is through this modularity Amio empowers its users to navigate through omics data without imposing on them any rigid workflows. But of course, this uh, makes things much more difficult. Uh, not only difficult from a technical standpoint, implementing something like this is truly very difficult, but also it makes things difficult for the users because instead of putting some raw data in and getting some Excel spreadsheets out, they you are now uh, 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 enforced to use this platform only if you know what you want to do, which is a very difficult thing in science. Most of us uh, oftentimes don't know what we need to do. We just want some Excel spreadsheets uh, uh, sometimes to start even seeing things. So the beginning becomes uh, truly very difficult. Um, but in a sense, Amu implements uh, by doing this a kitchen for you. Uh, so uh, you can go into this kitchen and feel in full control. And having been to multiple kitchens with uh, absolute control, I know how difficult it is to come up with anything really uh, useful or worth sharing with others. But then, you know, being able to do it is still a good thing, uh, I, I, I believe, in some cases at least. So one apology Amio offers for this added complexity into everyone's lives is uh, uh, its integrated visualization. So uh, although it has a relatively steep learning curve, Amio can make some pretty figures. Of course, what is even prettier here is the fact that most of these uh, uh, static figures you see in the screen are in fact coming from interactive interfaces where you click around and learn more about your data set and zoom in, zoom out and look at coverages uh, or amino acid sequence alignments and, and so on. So, um, and just like everything else, interactive interfaces in AMI are also dynamic and um, follow your lead. You can change them. That's why there's a 
large diversity of different ways to present data and not just the same thing uh, with different numbers uh, in it. Um, recognizing the difficulty of uh, uh, learning Yamio, we had been pre-COVID world uh, uh, organizing workshops. And uh, in the last three years pre-COVID, we actually managed to reach out to over 700 scientists uh, through our uh, workshops in various places. But of course, now it is not, uh, uh, it has not been possible to do that during last year. Clearly, we need to change things a little bit. Perhaps we can put together virtual uh, workshops because here we are all together talking about stuff and it's not uh, too difficult to throw in a terminal environment and start talking about how to do analyses, but we haven't done that because uh, we didn't feel we were ready for that kind of uh, 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 challenge yet, but uh, we need to probably think about it. But one of the workshops that we uh, have always enjoyed very much is the one that is in France uh, uh, called EBAM. Um, if someone can post the uh, pronunciation, uh, uh, how we write EBAM uh, to chat, it would be great. Um, it's, it's a workshop organized by primarily Lois uh, Manian. And this year, uh, Lois decided to at least try to see if we can do an in-person workshop around July. So some of us are getting vaccinated at the moment and I hope you all will have access to uh, uh, similar uh, um, solutions very soon. If that works out, we're going to plan to have a, a workshop this year at EBAM. So uh, if you're interested, keep an eye. But um, uh, you don't uh, uh, need us in our workshops, hopefully, since uh, the, the community around AMIO has been steadily growing. So this is not a software platform that is only uh, used by us, but uh, used by many others. Uh, and this is a set of flags uh, uh, after a, a Twitter, very formal Twitter uh, uh, inquiry to see uh, where, where, uh, where our users work at or, and live. And uh, if you are on this call and if you don't see your flag here, uh, let us know uh, so we can uh, edit too. Uh, and uh, not only users, uh, uh, the growing user base, but also uh, we are lucky to get a lot of uh, contributions from developers at large. So these are some of the names from the industry and uh, various institutions around the world who had been contributing to AMBIO uh, in, in, uh, in various ways. And uh, we also have a Slack channel uh, uh, with more than 700 members as of this morning. And uh, during the last three years, we had more than 14,000 messages. Uh, it's a lot of messages. And um, uh, you can uh, participate to this if you like. Uh, and you can ask your questions and engage in conversations and meet other like-minded people and so on. Not only questions about AMIO, we often get questions about uh, omics and in general study design and uh, what to do with, with the, the scientific question, how to approach it. Uh, and we do our best uh, to support uh, whoever is there and whoever is asking questions. So I would encourage you to feel free to give us a visit if, you're, uh, uh, if you think this could be beneficial to you. Now I want to uh, uh, take just a few more minutes uh, uh, to discuss what makes it worth for us to continue working on Anvio. Uh, and um, uh, that is its integrative capabilities. Uh, we benefit in, in our group and in other groups that uh, rely on AMIO for their science. Uh, the integrative capabilities of AMIO is one of the most uh, important uh, uh, aspects of it. And uh, also most difficult one to achieve in some ways. Um, to cover this topic, I, uh, I will give um, an example using one of our recent publications. And this publication that that I want to discuss data integration AMIO with is one that was published a few years ago now, but um, uh, I, uh, I think it's very relevant because this is one of the most comprehensive uh, uh, integrative efforts we uh, managed to put together. Tom Dalmont uh, and Evan Kiefel was the co-first authors of the study. Uh, I think at least uh, Evan is on the call, uh, I'm sure, because he's going to, you're going to hear from Evan in a minute. So in this study, we focused SAR-11, which is a globally abundant microbial clade in surface oceans. I'm not going to go into details of uh, the science behind the study, but I want to uh, discuss um, how different types of data, which different kinds of data were integrated uh, for the study, in fact. Uh, so we, um, uh, for these set of genomes, we first identified uh, gene clusters in the SAR-11 gene pool through pangenomics. 
to which we integrated SAR11 subclades in the literature through phylogenetics, to which we integrated ancestral relationships between SAR11 genomes based on ribosomal uh, uh, protein sequences through phylogenomics, which is shown here, uh, to which we integrated SAR11 ecology using more than 31 billion metagenomic reads we obtained from Tara Ocean's project and um, Ocean Sampling Day uh, metagenomes. Then we use single copy core genes, uh, the pan genome reveal, and the metagenomic read recruitment results to study the genomic heterogeneity of uh, a globally abundant SAR11 population, which enabled us to combine all these data with the predicted protein structures of SAR11 core genes to employ in silico protein biochemistry to investigate how the proteome of SAR11 responds to changing waters as it carried around uh, the globe through the conveyor belt of uh, uh, the oceans. So what you're seeing here may come across as a difficult task to accomplish. Um, it indeed was. Uh, it took years uh, for us to actually publish the study, but I, I'd like to stress still multiple uh, uh, points here. First important point in my opinion is that uh, AMIO was not designed for this task in particular, uh, but accomplishing this task was only possible thanks to the modular and flexible design behind the platform. And uh, second important point is uh, that this study is very likely among the most comprehensive multiomic studies that are available to us today. And the difference between um, uh, the way AMU implements multiomics and other popular multiomics approaches is that the integration you see here in, in this figure is not a collage of independent analyzed aspect of these data, but it rather represents one of many possible displays that could emerge from where these data were already integrated in their most native form. Uh, so it's one of uh, representations of something much more comprehensive. Uh, I know it uh, uh, perhaps does not make any sense immediately, but what I'm trying to say is all these pieces you see here, we didn't independently analyze them and put them together. Basically, you can, they, in a very native form, these, uh, what you see here is all together integrated already in, uh, with, a, with AMIO programs, you're able to access the different parts of this data. So also an important point is that uh, what, underlies this uh, uh, display in, is in fact available to everyone to study other aspects of these data without having to redo all the intermediate analyses we had to, do to come to this point. And uh, for instance, if you were to take a look at the study and go to the code and data available section of it, you would see this. And um, uh, then you will see the, the, the AMIO data currencies are publicly accessible. So these are uh, all the uh, AMIO currencies that you can reproduce things. And they are accessible for further analysis because they are published on uh, 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 Zenodo and Figshare uh, where you uh, manage to get, an, get a DOI and your data stays there forever. Uh, and if you put in your paper, it's a part of your study. Uh, and if, if you were to, uh, for instance, focus on the, the figure I showed, the SAR11 metapan genome, the entire figure I showed you in a, uh, 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 moments ago. And if you click that link, you would go to uh, this page where you can download this file. And this artifact uh, uh, is an uh, artifact for an AMIO uh, PAN database, which would help you enter the AMIO software ecosystem directly from here. So that piece of uh, file, uh, if you download it, will represent this in this uh, 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 ecosystem, which means we used uh, uh, and we display a pan genome to display it. And, and uh, uh, we got sequences from it using another program in this collection, but um, you can use different AMIO tools to ask different questions to the data from which we shared only a single perspective with you. There is of course, tremendous amount of information embedded in that figure and behind that data that we did not investigate, that we did not share in our study. We actually, for instance, looked at a single genome out of 21 that, were, that was shown in the pan genome. So you can actually look at the rest. Uh, so uh, because uh, AMIO currencies uh, are self-contained databases that, that enables you to work further on them uh, if you were to share with them. And just for a second, imagine uh, uh, that you could do this with uh, the primary data generated in many studies we see today. And uh, the very thought, uh, that very thought would uh, take you from the beginnings of 2000s and slowly would bring you to 2021 is where I think we should be uh, 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 in omics research. Uh, technically, these, are, these things are feasible today, but uh, we just need to change uh, the mindset and push for it, I think. So uh, 
basically what I wanted to do in this uh, section was to give you a brief idea about some of the technical aspects of AMIO that are not so easy to talk about. Um, instead of going through individual programs in AMIO when what you can do and what you can't do with it and so on, I wanted to uh, 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 try to offer a broad understanding. And I hope during Q&A, we can go into the, the, uh, uh, the other details of the platform. I'm sure you have a lot of questions uh, and um, uh, I hope we will have enough answers for you. But now I want to switch gears without taking much more time and focus on uh, new tools in AMU V7. So AMU has already a lot of tools. Uh, some of you have, have been using the platform for a while, uh, but uh, what is new in V7? We will hear from uh, the developers of uh, uh, V7 and uh, we will go one by one. And um, these individuals, if they are willing, uh, I see Jessica Pan is here right now. Uh, we will start with her. Uh, if they are willing, they, I, they will unmute themselves and I, I will advance slides for them. So uh, one of the, uh, I think, uh, uh, most important uh, aspects of V7 is uh, the integrated help system uh, that uh, Jessica Pan uh, helped us put together. Uh, would you like to go through it, uh, Jessica? Uh, sure. Perfect. Okay. So I'm Jessica Pan. I'm an undergrad at MIT, and my main contribution to Anvio v7 was working on the new help doc system to handle Anvio's increasing complexity and address, like Miran talked about, um, the relatively steep learning curve for beginners to the program. So um, if you run any program in when running Anvio, if you run any program with the help flag, then you can see, um, besides normal parameter information, you can see um, a summary of the program, as well as a list of Anvio artifacts that it takes in and can output. Um, and then you can also see these links to more information. So what do these links actually look like? Um, well, they um, here you can see they have information on how to get help with Anvio, as well as the full program network that uh, Mirren displayed before. Um, you can also see a comprehensive list of programs and artifacts in Anvio, including really brief descriptions, and um, like the input output information like before. Um, if you click on one of these links, like if you're in, unfamiliar to a specific program, say the PAN database, um, then you can see more information, including a full like description on how to use a PAN database. But then let's say one of these other programs is unfamiliar, like um, NVDB information. Um, you can then click on that link to navigate to that page to get more information on how to use that specific program. This way, you can really navigate through the Anvio network until all concepts are clear. Um, see, this page includes a full description and some usage case examples that you can use. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, so uh, we implemented the technical framework for this. And then Jessica filled it in with all the uh, information by retrospectively going through all the uh, AMIO programs and concepts. Um, uh, so next we have um, Evan, Evan Keepel. And uh, Evan, the microphone hi. is yours. Uh, hi, so I'm a PhD student in Marin's lab. Um, and like a lot of um, the developers who work on AMBIO, most of my contributions are really just a direct result of my research needs. Um, and one of my research needs was working with massive data sets that up until now, MVO has been too slow to really accommodate for. And the problem was that the program MV Profile was a severe bottleneck. So what is MV Profile? Well, in the standard metagenomic workflow, you've got metagenomes that are mapped to contates. And this is carried out by some external mapping software such as Bowtie or BWA. And the data is stored as a BAM file. Um, to, and so to get this mapping information into a format that's readable by Ambio, the program Ambi Profile creates a database that takes as input this BAM file and summarizes its information. So basically, this process involves reading each and every read and processing each one. And then through this iterative analysis that can contain billions of reads, coverage values, single nucleotide variants, single codon variants, and some other things as well, 
are all calculated and stored in the profile database. Could you click there? Thanks. Um, so with this database in hand, all of the necessary mapping information can be used and accessed by this network of MBO programs that Maren was talking about. So for example, uh, you see in this inspect page, almost all of the data here bes besides the genes are actually taken or stored and accessed from the profile database. So all this is to say that MV profile is a mission critical program that's central to Anvio metagenomics. And it was my bottleneck for my data set. So after a lot of work, which I can go into uh, later during the Q&A, I basically changed the way that reads are processed and ended up speeding up Anvio profile substantially. So in this test case, I had 350,000 contigs, one 14 gigabyte BAM file, and I ran it over nine threads. And now MV profile runs in 58 minutes. So in, in this particular case, MV profile runs about 125 times faster. And I think in general, anyone who runs MV profile should experience at least like a 10 times gain in speed. So if you were suffering from that, uh, hopefully this solves your problem. Um, next, um, Another research thing, I work with a lot of allele frequency data at the nucleotide and amino acid level. And what I've noticed in the field is that we're a lot better at identifying sequence variants than we are at interpreting them. And I think a lot of this stems from our stubbornness in representing genes as sequences rather than as 3D objects which have structural properties that determine their function. So that's why in the latest version of Anvio, I worked with one of the developers, Ozgen, to create an interactive environment uh, so you can display metagenomic sequence variants uh, directly onto predicted protein structures. So basically, I believe that adopting structure-aware analyses reveals insight that you just can't learn from sequences alone. And in the same vein, in the current release of Anvio, I worked on integrate integrating an amazing resource into Anvio called Interactome. So what's Interactome? Well, it's a resource by Mona Zing and Shilpa Cobrin that describes the likelihood that individual uh, residues found in protein domains are involved in binding to ligands. So specifically, it's a collection of PFAMs for which some of their members have experimentally determined protein structures. And not only do these members have experimentally determined structures, but they also have been chosen because they happen to have co-crystallized uh, with their ligand binding partners. So by matching these PFAMs that have per residue annotated binding uh, frequencies to your genes of interest uh, with the help of like an HMM model, you can map the binding frequencies from the protein domain to your specific genes. And that's what we're seeing in this table, uh, which is stored in the context database. So all of this is now a new feature of Anvio that's carried out by the program Anvi Run Interactome, which you can learn more about on the bottom right. Um, and after running this program, basically, you can play with the data in various ways. So on the right, for example, is uh, coming from an example in the infant gut tutorial, which you can find on the Marin Lab website, in which an acetyltransferase's binding site is being highlighted on the surface of that protein, um, which has been predicted for a user's gene of interest. So if you want to ask me um, anything else, uh, please do so during the Q&A. Um, but until then, I'll pass it off to the next developer. Thank you very much, uh, Evan. Next, we have Isaac Fink. Um, Isaac? Yeah, so I'm an undergrad at the lab um, at the University of Chicago. Um, and for V7, I focused on revamping the interactive inspection page, uh, which visualizes content coverages. And I specifically focused on um, visualizing additional metadata that comes with the context database. So the first being um, gene functional annotations. 
Um, so on the bottom here, these colored gene arrows um, are representing um, different cog categories. So for example, in this visualization, uh, you might be able to, to identify that the arrows colored in green are all involved in amino acid metabolism. Um, and this visualization also works with, with databases like KEG. Um, and, and this um, display also allows you to select specific gene IDs. Um, for example, this, this could be useful in identifying a genomic island. Um, this, this revamp also includes a new settings panel as shown to the, to the right here, which both organizes all the new features and also allows the user to, to save or load um, customizations in a state. Um, and it also adds new features such as a nucleotide display that's uh, shown on the next slide here. And towards the bottom that has uh, DNA and amino acid information. Um, this, this addition also addresses the need to um, visualize insertions and deletions data in addition to uh, single nucleotide variant data. So on the right here, um, there's, there's a visualization of five different deletions, uh, each with a, with a data table from the context DB. And then also the revamped uh, SNV visualization on the left. Thank you very much, Isaac. I want to quickly add something here because uh, you may be surprised to see uh, indels uh, in, in mapping results, which are not commonly accessible to us in high throughput uh, 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 coverage uh, evaluations. Uh, this is also thanks to uh, uh, something Evan included in AMI profile while he was reworking the entire AMI profile. Uh, the new strategy he implemented enabled us to go uh, beyond what is what was very easily accessible from pileups, but now uh, uh, AMU is able to characterize uh, structural changes in reference context by looking uh, at short read mapping. Therefore, we have uh, insertions and deletions characterized in our tables, just like single nucleotide variants. And uh, this has been very interesting for us to learn new things about what coverage patterns emerge from what kind of changes uh, in the reference but I hope we will, uh, it will also be useful uh, to you. And Isaac uh, masterfully connected that infrastructure to the interface by working with Evan. So that's what you're seeing here. All right, next we have uh, Matthew Klein. Matthew. Hi everybody. Uh, I'm a programmer with the Envio team. I've only been with the team for a short time. So I was very excited to be able to contribute to a couple of additions in the interactive interface for V7. The first is uh, the feature, the ability to bin items within a range or to work with items in a range and do whatever you want with them. So instead of having to click each individual item, users can now set a range and add these items to the current bin, as well as remove those items from anything. Uh, the feature is accessed via the right context menu. And so you can see all your options after setting the first outer range limit. And this little tool should save users a lot of time and clicks. The second new feature is an interface for visualizing bootstrap values, uh, which was something, a feature request from the community that we were able to address uh, on a preliminary level at this point. Um, but previously, MVO was aware of these bootstrap value data points. You could see the numerical value through the mouse menu, but visualizing them wasn't an option. Now users are able to display bootstrap values directly on their trees with a number of user settable parameters. Um, again, this is currently a preliminary version. So we're excited to see how the community engages with this tool and how we can build and improve upon it for future releases. And finally, just as a last little thing, I just wanna thank everybody in the Anvio group and in the community at large that have helped me get up to speed and able to work on the platform in such a short time. So thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, next, we have uh, Eva uh, Vesely. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Eva. I'm a third year grad student in the Marin Lab. Uh, and for NVO V7, I worked mostly on a suite of programs for estimating metabolic potential in genomes and metagenomes. Next slide, please. Um, so the purpose of these programs is to add more context to gene annotations in your data sets by linking them to known metabolic pathways. For now, we are using the KEG databases to provide definitions of well-known path metabolic pathways. So if Marin, you could click, this is one such example. This is a glycolysis uh, pathway in the KEG module database. 
Um, KEG also provides a set of HMM profiles called COFAMs with which you can annotate uh, your genes in your, in your genomes. Um, so there are three main programs in, in this suite. The first one, and we set up KEG COFAMs, sets up this KEG data on your computer. Uh, the second one, which is and we run CAG COFAMs, uh, uses the COFAM profiles to annotate gene calls in your context databases. And the third, and we estimate metabolism, is the program that matches those, those gene annotations to the metabolic pathways from the CAG module database. So it can estimate how complete each metabolic module is. And it can do this at a few different levels of resolution, depending on your input type. So it can do it for an entire isolate genome, for each bin in a metagenome separately, or if you have an unbinned metagenome where you don't know which contexts go together, you can estimate metabolism for each context separately. So NV estimate metabolism can provide a variety of different output files for you to look at or to send to downstream programs for analysis. So one type, which is shown here as an example on the slide, is long format tab delimited output. Um, this particular example is modules mode output, which lists information about each metabolic module, including how complete it is. And in this case, it's for every bin in the collection that was provided to the program. Another output option is matrix format, in which case every column is a genome or a bin, and every row is a module. So in this example, we have a matrix of module completeness scores. The advantage of this output format is that it can be easily visualized. For example, if you click Marin, uh, you will see an example of a heat map of module completeness, which we generate in and be interactive. So this is um, a new feature in V7 that wasn't there before and it's still being actively developed. Um, so I would appreciate the community to test it and send me their feedback so I can continue to improve it in further iterations. And if you guys have uh, further questions on uh, how it is working, then uh, I guess I will answer them later. Thank you, Eva. Next, we have Amy Willis. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Amy Willis. I'm an assistant professor at uh, at the University of Washington. I, my research group is called the Statistical Diversity Lab or the StatDiv Lab, and we develop statistical methods for the analysis of microbiome data um, or other biodiversity data. Um, so my main contribution for ANVO V7 was to propose a new statistical inference framework for testing functional enrichment. The function is called ANV Compute Functional Enrichment. Um, sort of informally, because I'm not going to assume that everyone here um, has taken has extensive training in statistical inference. Um, we're interested in assessing whether or not a function is associated with a particular lifestyle. So that could be a niche breadth, um, that could be a uh, location, a particular location, a particular type of environment um, within, within um, in which that function, that environment might select, for example, for that function. Um, so formally, we're, this is a statistical hypothesis. Uh, that null hypothesis is that the prevalence of the function in one group is equal to the prevalence of the function in the other group. Um, as a methods developer, I see a wide variety of applied problems that I need to translate into statistical problems. And sometimes uh, the only way to translate it is through a very sophisticated modeling framework. Um, this is a situation where a pretty uh, straightforward off the shelf method uh, works really well. Um, so really this is a, a generalized linear model, um, essentially uh, a logistic regression. Um, but we've adapted it for this for this scenario. So we're, my research group is working on um, some alterations to this methodology to incorporate more features of this data. Um, but for now, this uh, this function works fantastic um, and is very fast. Uh, so please check out NV Compute Functional Enrichment. I'll give you a quick overview of what the inputs and outputs of this function are. Um, it takes in a pan genomes database genome storage, as well as a functional enrichment text file where you uh, provide MBO with the information regarding which genomes were present in your different environments, um, and then letting it know which uh, variable you want to perform your uh, analysis on, which, which is the uh, lifestyle, for example, or location that you're interested in. Um, the output is going to give you a list of um, the functions. It's going to give you a test statistic uh, for, that, for that null hypothesis uh, framed on the previous slide. Um, that's the enrichment score column. We've got a p-value for testing the null hypothesis that uh, there is equal prevalence of the function across both of the groups. Um, we imagine that most folks are going to be performing this test over many different functions. Um, and so we've done, done um, multiple, uh, multiple testing adjustment by a false discovery rate control, giving you Q values here in this final column. 
um, conveniently lets you know which group is more associated uh, with the higher prevalence of your function, um, information about the uh, function that that line pertains to, and then the prevalence of that, uh, the sample prevalence of the function in both in your group. So here, this is an example looking at the Prochlorococcus pangenome, and we're looking at the prevalence of function across high light and low light environments. I'm happy to take questions uh, this time on Twitter um, or uh, by email. Thank you very much, Amy, for sharing your talent and expertise with the community this way. Uh, Amy mentioned uh, pan genomes, but I wanted to add one more slide to actually um, uh, mention uh, that uh, uh, th this tool, um, thanks to the collaboration uh, between Amy and Eva, uh, can also take groups of genomes uh, to to uh, look at function enrichment scores uh, beyond pan genomes as well. And, and now keg estimates are also uh, uh, can be analyzed with the same approach. Um, Next, we have uh, uh, Matt. Um, Matt is on, right? Yep, oh, yes. Here. Hi, Matt. <laughs> hey, everyone. My name is Matt. I'm a second year PhD student uh, in the Marin Lab, coming from the Committee on Microbiology. And for Ambio V7, I primarily worked on a tool called Ambi Export Locus. Uh, this tool is developed um, to address my research needs and our in house research needs to extract a ton of bacterial loci from genomes and metagenomes. Uh, genomic loci and bacteria and archaea are, can be really important fitness determinants, uh, such as operons or uh, genomic islands. And uh, let's quickly go through how it works. So like most tools in AMBIO, you need to have a context database, which uh, houses your genome or a metagenomic context. And then you, you kind of have just one more step. You could use the tool AMBI Export Locus, which then uses a search term for the gene name of interest, which acts as an anchor for your um, specific loci. And then you could put in the number of genes upstream and downstream from that particular gene. And AMBI Expert Locus will extract that smaller genomic context from the larger genomic context. And so below, here's a little schematic of a possible workflow. So you could have um, a lot of metagenomic contigs or one contig coming from one genome. And then AMBI Export Locus can come in and cut out your loci, specifically looking for a search term, such as uh, SUSD, which is a carbohydrate binding protein and then go four genes upstream and a one gene downstream, and then cut out um, those loci for you to do your cool science after and compare them and look at gene contents. So uh, AMBI Export Locus has a couple of different modes because not all loci come in the same shapes and sizes. And so one way is the default mode, which is already explained before. Um, if you can add slide, Marin. Yeah, so the default mode is the out of the box mode where you provide an anchor like search term and then you could have a certain amount of genes upstream and a certain amount of genes downstream, and it will give you a fixed length of loci that's going to consistently bring out. And then if you have a loci that has um, multiple kinds of gene content, you could use flank mode where you provide two search terms that uh, define the uh, flanks of the genes. So if there's a gene insertion uh, or deletion event in your loci, AMBI Expert Locus will to deal with that and give you all the versions of the loci you have. Um, I have a tutorial for this on the Marin Lab website, which I'll post in the chat below. And if you have any more questions, I look forward to hearing it. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, next, we have Sam uh, Miller. Sam. Hi, I'm a postdoc in Marin's group. I've been developing new tools to interpret the results of tRNA sequencing. This is a revolutionary technology that's been developed by Tao Pan's group at the University of Chicago. Uh, Tao Pan is a professor who, in collaboration with his postdoc, Chris Katansky, and a graduate student, Chris Watkins, uh, have been able to access a whole realm of biology that's previous, previously been quite recalcitrant due to the um, stability of tRNA, the inability of the molecule to be directly sequenced. So through their efforts, um, they've been able to generate high throughput sequence data for tRNAs and other small RNAs. And um, tRNAs are extremely important being at the um, center of all biology because they're directly involved in translation in the ribosome. Uh, they comprise about 9% of all RNA in a cell with uh, ribosomal RNA, structural RNA being about 90% and mRNA only being about 1%. Uh, so they're quite abundant, and therefore they're a whole treasure trove of biological information 
since there's a specific tRNA, an anticodon, that's able to decode specific codons in the genome and thereby favor certain uh, complements of genes in the genome. Uh, so the question arises how we actually separate the wheat from the chaff in the sequence data. There are a lot of artifacts that are generated in these millions of sequences. Lots of other RNAs uh, are processed as well. And so I developed a novel dynamic programming algorithm to use the known set of features, the conserved primary sequence structure, uh, the conserved secondary sequence structure of tRNA in order to predict which sequences are tRNA and which are not. And this also yields a feature profile telling you, for example, what the anticodon is of the tRNA. So recall that there are uh, 61 different codons, and so there are also equivalent number of anticodons, which can sometimes decode more than one codon. tRNAs are also chock full of modifications, nucleotide modifications. These are just the known modifications from humans. No one knows what most modifications are across the tree of life, um, but they're especially rich in tRNA, and they, along with the pool of different tRNAs, decoding different codons vary on the order of minutes to hours. So they regulate, they intimately regulate um, the cell's response to environmental perturbations. You don't need to grow a new cell to respond to the environment when you can just modify your pool of tRNA, modify which genes you're decoding. And with the modifications, change the rate at which those genes are being translated into proteins. So we've developed an interface um, in Anvio to implement um, my prediction of tRNAs in the prediction of modifications, which is also a new feature, which can't be done with existing technology. Uh, we're able to do this across all three domains of life. Unlike 16S, it isn't just specific to prokaryotes. You get everything in your sample in one shoot, in one shot. Uh, so we generate certain Anvio currencies that are shared with the metagenomics workflow, the contigs database and the profile database that you might be familiar with. These are used by the program Anvi Interactive to create the display, the interactive display. And these are the characteristic layers that you might see in your metagenomics experiment. Uh, on the outside, we see the taxonomic assignment of each tRNA. So actually each, each bar here represents one of a thousand different tRNAs that I've selected. These are just the top thousand from um, a tongue scraping actually. And we can see the taxonomic classification of each one of those tRNAs with tools that we've developed in Anvio leveraging GTDB which is a comprehensive database of prokaryotic genomes. And then you can see the amino acid um, and anticodon assignments of each of the tRNAs and the coverage levels and other abundance information across samples. And then we can inspect individual tRNA sequences to see how the coverage varies across the tRNA um, in between samples and also how coverage um, how the abundances of tRNAs vary between different organisms. And then the bars there, instead of being single nucleotide variants, as you would see in a metagenomics data set, are the predicted modification sites that you get out of NVTRNA seq. And we can confirm all of these predictions um, with the known with the organisms that are currently known through specific experiments looking at specific modifications. For example, here we see um, methylcytidine uh, in the anticodon loop of this uh, tRNA arginine. So this is a whole new realm of biology that Tao Pan's group um, has allowed us to access. And we'd really appreciate if you consider using this too, and you should contact me by email and we can see if your data sets are appropriate. I think it's highly complementary to other multi-omics strategies. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, I, I uh, uh, anticipate that most of you are uh, not necessarily 
seeing the relevance or importance of this, but uh, the, the, perhaps the take home message is that uh, uh, AMU creates uh, a framework for us to aid things, even people may not be interested yet, but uh, could be relevant in the future. So having access to these things uh, enables us to develop them early on, often in collaboration with others, uh, as our guidance to make sure that we're not just uh, developing things for the sake of developing them, but actually uh, developing them to answer biological questions. So if you use uh, any of these, uh, there's always someone who is very invested in uh, 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 pushing uh, their boundaries. So we would really be very happy to hear from you. And uh, with Sam's uh, input, I think this uh, uh, section of our uh, gathering ends. And uh, I want to thank uh, everyone who uh, managed to be able to hear today uh, and present their work. There are others who are not uh, here and not mentioned, but I also uh, thank them very much for uh, pushing us uh, this far.